Other bits are just in some text, so you have to read the text and pull out, oh, well, this is actually a piece of data that I'm interested in from a governance perspective, from a process perspective, from a regulatory reporting perspective, and all the things you need to do with it. So it's uh, not the easiest of thing. Anyone could go and have a look. Uh, I don't suggest you do, because it's quite dry and very boring, but you can go and look and just look on the ESMA site and pick up all this documentation and have a look at it and read this particular one. The big problem with it though is it's a bit of a moving target because the documentation that has been put out is on draft and it keeps changing. And the reason it keeps changing is because ESMA keep getting it wrong. Um, the, the legislation comes out from the EU and then ESMA interprets it, writes it, and then it's unclear. Additionally to that, um, everyone keeps coming back from the, from the uh, financial services industry and says, we're not quite sure what you mean by this, it's not clear, um, I don't understand this, or I don't see how this is going to work, please give us some clarity. So they do keep changing. So, let's have a look at an example of here, a um, bit of audience participation here. So, we have some show of hands. Um, at, at the top left it says, buy sell indicators, and this is what it's about. So this is a key, well, not a key part, but a part of MIFI, which is linked us into some, some data governance issues around this. So, buy sell indicator, who's the buyer? So we've got a shop on the left hand side, shop A, nice man on the, on the uh, other side, uh, man B, and there's some groceries going one way and some money going the other way. So, show of hands for who's the buyer. Who thinks A is the buyer? Who thinks B is the buyer? Okay, that's probably what I thought you'd say. Okay, slightly different example. There's the bank. And there's a person again, and there's some shares coming across from the bank to the person, and some money going the other way. So, who thinks bank A is the buyer? Okay, couple. How about who thinks the person B is the buyer? Okay, so that's what we thought. And let's have a look at someone slightly different. Okay, so this is a an FX transaction, a forward transaction, between two banks. So there's some money going between bank A to bank B, some dollars, and some pounds, sterling going from B to A. Okay, so who's the buyer? Who thinks A is the buyer? Okay, we've got... I'm not falling for this. Four. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Come, come on, come on then. How about B? Who B is the buyer? Okay, and there was quite a lot that didn't make their hand at all, so you're not even sure, is that right? Yeah. Both the buyer. Yeah, it's a yeah. Okay, all right. Mutual item. Edge of stocks. Okay, so it's either one or the other, or they're both buyers, or neither of them are buyers, maybe. Okay, right, let's have a look then. Unfortunately, it doesn't show very well, but, but what this is talking about is the RTS 6, which is about algorithmic trading, if you know what that is. And you've got a, a, an indicator that's either buy, B U Y I, buy, or S E W L for sale. Okay, and it has a description. That, that tells you what it is. <laughs> okay, that's the description. Now that's small. Um, it's it's small when I put it on there, and I, I checked this on, on Word. There's 421 words in that definition. Oh Jesus! Sorry? It depends on the, the alphabetic sorting of dollar versus G, GBP. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the red rug, you notice the red rug, the flashing red rug. Yeah. So, in the case of swaps and forwards related to currencies and of cross-currency swaps, the buyer should be the counterparty you see in the currency, which is first when sorted alphabetically by ISO 4217 standard, and the seller should be the counterparty delivering this currency, right. which is obviously very clear. <laughs> 
open your mouth open. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Arbitrary is what I do. Yeah, it is a bit, okay? Bullshit. So, 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 okay, so for, for, for this example, GPP comes first. Um, so actually, it was, I think it was the one on that side, which is A, which is the one that we, we see in the currency. Yeah. Uh, yeah. GPP before USD, so buyer would be A and seller would be B in our example. So, from that aspect, we can see that there was a certain amount of confusion around this and why you need some data governance around certain things that um, uh, Nicola was showing us around definition. You need to know what it is you're doing and sort out your definition of what it means. And on the face of it, it doesn't actually, you would look at it and if you approached a lot of people in certain areas, if you go to equities and say, can you tell me if you've got a buy-sell flag? And they say, yeah, I've got a buy-sell flag. They know it quite easily. Yeah, and they've already got that. If you go to FX, they say no. So the aspect of governance is, is important here from a definition perspective. Okay, so let's have a look at really the data governance and where does that really fit in relating to the DM box, the wheel. Um, 1.0 wheel. It's got the nine. It hasn't got the new ones in. Sorry. It's missing the registered trademark, and I apologise for that as well. Um, so, in a in in MIFID 2 implementation, um, a, a program of work to get it in. There's, there's lots of facets come in here, and I think from what we were looking at earlier, all the data management functions have some part to play in the program of work. So I, I made my initial assessment of where I think the degree of impact is across these. Um, some areas are probably impacted more. Obviously governance at the middle is hugely important. But then we look at data quality management. That's a big issue around MIFID reporting. Yeah. Um, you probably all, all read stories in, in the press, uh, in the IT press, or the, the, the general press about banks being fined, um, all sorts of financial institutions. Why do they get fined? They get fined because they, they've done something wrong, or they're not doing their regulatory reporting right. Yeah, um, it's the main things they do. Yeah, and if you've got your data quality wrong you're going to report the wrong things, or not report something that you should report, or a multitude of other things like that. Uh, other big things here, I suppose, is the miles from reference data down at the bottom here. Um, one, of, one of the big issues that, that MIFID is, is looking at is transparency, particularly from OTC products. Anyone know what OTC products are? <coughs> this man does. Anyone else? So, yeah, OTC, over the counter products. So, not exchange traded, yeah? So, if you, if you go and buy your shares, you go and buy some shares in whatever company. Aviva, yeah? Um, you go and buy some shares in Aviva, you can go and buy them, you buy them through the stock exchange and exchange traded, and you get price ticks, and you can see what the prices are and how they change during the day, and there's lots of transparency around the whole thing. OTC products, things like commodities, you can buy a commodities future, you can't buy it on an exchange, so you need to buy OTC, so you have that one-to-one -one negotiation with your bank or your commodities house to say, I'm interested in buying, I can get barrels of oil, you need to buy you know, 100,000 barrels of oil that turn up in six months' time, and I want to pay this much money, and whatever. So, reference data is a big issue because they're trying to drive reference data. Anyone heard of something called an ISIN? Okay, ISIN. ISIN is a, it's a symbol that gets attached to a, a stock. So, every stock that you buy has an ISIN. Yeah? Um, and you can identify the stock by its ISIN. Yeah? Biggest problem they have is OTCs don't have ISINs. And all the regulation says, report an ISIN. 
Yeah. So if we looked at data quality relating to that and the reference data, you'd say, I have a big gap here because I've got lots of products that have no IC. Yeah, so on the, on the data quality dimensions for completeness, you'd be very, very low score on that one. Yeah. So this is where I'm thinking that, that we are really around the data management functions and how it fits into the program. Certain areas not used too much. Uh, document and content management doesn't really come into it too much. Um, database ops, not too much. Uh, security, less so. Okay, so what's, what's the data governance chasm? So, in an, in an organisation that I've been working with, um, data, data governance and the policies and standards and procedures and such like that he already has are relatively mature. So over on the right hand side here, we've got the alignment to existing enterprise data management policies and standards. The aspect of data stewards is well, well understood. Yeah. Metadata collection, DQ processes covering the whole supply chain, <coughs> accountability identified, all the roles are there. Data sharing agreements are in place. I think that was <coughs> mentioned and talked about lineage and that aspect. And the data sharing agreement really between producers and consumers, formalising that, that contractual aspect about who can use what data for what purpose. And you know, if, if I give you data, I have some responsibility for it when it's moved on in the organisation. Um, so there are all the parts that I think are in place at an enterprise level. Over on the other side, on the bits that you can't really read, um, and I'll just run down those parts. So, closing it, or what is the chasm? I suppose we have over the left hand side lots of different systems. So the data resides in many systems, probably in the thing I'm looking at, around about 80 to 100 different systems. So it's a lot of collection of data. And some of them that need to exist, uh, some of them that, that we need to get data from, don't even exist yet. Which makes it a little bit more difficult in terms of governance aspect, because it's not even there yet. So you're sort of designing governance into some things that are going to come along in the future. Yeah. Other, other parts that need to cross the chasm. The data is defined using a sort of an external taxonomy by ESMA. They have their own language, they have their own parts. It's not common to other regulators. The US regulators tend to use a different language to talk about the same thing. Um, and even you see within the, the RTSs that they're inconsistent. You, you can find four different names for a field that actually relate to the trade date and time. Um, there's, there's trade date time, um, trade um, day underscore time, um, trade time, um, and then there's time of trade. Yeah, there's lots of them, and, and they're all confusing, and everyone's going, oh, I don't quite understand which one I'm supposed to have and which one. Yeah, that's, that's a issue there. Changing data requirements that come along here. Um, it's a big problem. ESMA keep changing their mind, they keep reissuing it, and it changes. Um, the whole thing around ISIN is going to rumble on for a while as to what's going to happen there. Yep, so that was the part there. Uh, lack of clarity on reference data for instruments. Um, some of it doesn't even exist yet. Um, I think you're supposed to be bringing it under sort of some form of governance and understand how it flows through the organisation be used. And there's, there's, a, there's an absence of data. Um, supposedly, um, meant you had to get a hold of data for the volumes of OTC products that are being traded across the market. Um, it's a big question, no one knows quite where that's going to come from because effectively it's all between two in, well, individual of the two institutions that are trading with each other, no one's pulling all that information together to know what the volumes are going to be. So there, there, there's a big gap that needs to be filled here from, through the project. Okay. Pretty small. Um, so this is the, the practical steps about aligning 
the governments. So, so this is the approach of, of taking what we need to undertake from the governments and aligning it to the program of work. So rather than it being a separate exercise that happens um, separate from it, it'll go along and be running in hand in hand within roughly the, the, um, the major stages of the program. So MIFID 2 is not going to actually go in and go live work because we have dates on it, but mostly 2018 is the first bit that's been put back a bit because no one's ready for it. Um, so mostly what's happening at the moment is the requirements and data analysis phase. So what we looked at is some, some sort of prerequisites that need to come in the green boxes, um, some aspects around um, tooling and architectural impact, uh, data architecture and metadata and some metrics that we need to define up front to understand how far we are through the process of this. And then mostly what the things that are happening mostly at the moment are sort of boxes one and two, requirements and data analysis and the data architecture and design space. Number of inputs, number of outputs there. Um, so we look around this, use cases, data requirements, data domain model, business terms, business elements. You know, all inputs coming in, architecture outputs. Um, Nicola mentioned earlier was issues and questions. The log around what the outstanding questions you have, what you need to manage the process. Um, whole, whole bunch of legal questions. There's loads and loads of legal questions that everyone has still around this because no one knows what they're supposed to do for a lot of it. It's a pain. As we go across, um, we move through data architecture, operation, security, and data sharing agreements, and then ultimately at the end, we end up with uh, the adherence status. So we're adhering to all the enterprise policies and standards. Um, the data architecture is complete. All the metadata has been collected, it's well understood. All the metrics, uh, but they're both in terms of coverage of everything you need to do from a governance perspective, but also the metrics around data quality, measurement of data, uh, you supply the right data, how do you know it's complete, all So that's really around the, the, the steps that we're using. Um, I don't know what we're about out of time, so just to recap. I had a quick look at MIFID and what it means. Um, it, it, it's a dry and dusty subject. It's not very interesting, but it's important and it has to happen for lots of uh, FS organisations. We had a look at, at the chasm that exists between the enterprise policies and standards that need to be adhered to and bringing effectively a programme into that and joining that up. And then, again, we looked at some of the steps about how to align that to the program and what some of the practical inputs and deliverable parts are from that. So that was that, really. Questions? Were there any? What do we want to do later on? How much time for a few? Okay, okay. We'll keep that later. Yeah, we'll what do you mean? Okay.